Hello, the title of this presentation is Consumer Preferences for Animal Welfare Attributes, the Case of Gestation Creature Stalls. As we're well aware, the whole issue of animal well-being, more generally animal welfare is the term I'm going to use in today's discussion, is increasingly important in the U.S. marketplace. In particular, there's lots of pressures on U.S. livestock producers to either adjust their production practices or possibly be a little more transparent in what those production practices are on a whole host of things, including how they raise, how they treat their animals that are ultimately being used to produce meat, milk, and eggs for human consumption. One particular practice that's been uh, discussed nationally is the use of gestation crates or stalls, and we use the term crates or stalls interchangeably here today, in the swine industry. Real briefly, there's details about this elsewhere, but gestation crates or stalls are individual housing units for gestating sows or gills that are used at a period in time when female breeding stock are not lactating and not raising their offspring. Here we stand as of June 2010, and effectively seven states in the U.S. have either already banned or have put legislation or passed ballot initiatives that at some point in their future are going to ban that particular use of gestation creature stalls in their state. Okay? This, in turn, raises lots of questions for economists like myself that follow these issues, and the purpose of this short presentation are to highlight a study that looked at one of these questions, in particular, whether or not a ban on typical production practices such as the common use of gestation creates in the swine industry is optimal for consumers. So the objectives of this study, which I conducted in collaboration with Dr. Nicole Olink, who's at Purdue University, and Chris Wolf, who's at Michigan State University, are as follows. We want to estimate the consumer wills to pay for pork products that vary in the use of gestation stalls. Okay. Secondly, we want to examine if preferences, these wills to pay preferences, are tied in any way to the farm size from which the pork is originating. And we want to examine if bans themselves can be justified in the presence of a labeling scheme that might convey information about the use or non-use of gestation creature stalls. And finally, we want to estimate what the economic welfare impact is of instituting bans. What does that do to consumer economic welfare? What data did we use? Well, myself, Dr. Oleg, Dr. Wolf conducted numerous surveys and economic experiments on this issue. The data for this particular paper, which has more details on this study, is available on the web. And in particular, we conducted a survey in 2007 with Michigan residents, and that's the underlying data of this study. What we did was we conducted what we call choice experiments, which real shortly are simulated pork chop purchasing scenarios, where we asked people in a number of scenarios, which pork chop, if any, would you purchase, given a different price, a different farm size that pork chop was raised on, and then different origin of that pork product. The fourth main attribute of this analysis, which is the focus for today, is the production practices on that farm. In particular, we considered pork that was raised under typical practices, which would include use of gestation stalls, uh, if it came from a farm that used crate-free practices where a producer voluntarily adopted to take crate-free um, procedures not to use gestation creature stalls and the product eventually had a label that conveyed that information to consumers. But the key part in that story is the producer voluntarily chose to do that. Or the third production practice scenario was same kind of outcome for the producer except he's operating in a region or a state that's in a ban, okay? such as what California will be after Proposition 2 was passed Come January 2015, pork producers in that state will not be able to use gestation stalls, so that scenario would fit producers in that state. Real quickly, we estimated lots of economic models. Details, again, are available on paper. Some of the highlighted results I want to note here today are, first, we identified preferences for pork from small farms to be related with preferences for stall-free, crate-free pork. In particular, what we concluded was farm size appears to be a substitute for crate or stall use. This must be noted going forward because the pork industry is likely to end up with larger average farm size as it disadopts one practice. We tend to recognize economies of scale and scope, and we change average farm size, so there may be some unintended consequences of this. Another thing that's worth noting is we found multiple cases and examples of preference heterogeneity among the U.S. consumers, or more narrowly Michigan consumers in this study. Uh, in particular, we estimated one economic model that basically separates consumers into four different types, so we're allowing their preferences to vary, and the model says there's four different types of preference sets. They're labeled here on the screen. Um, I want to first note roughly two-thirds of the population have preferences that actually dislike pork coming from a region un operating under a ban, and one hypothesis for that is, is they actually discount a product that's coming from a situation where producers have less freedom, or in other words, the public values producer autonomy. That's one inference from that. Conversely, about 20% of our evaluated sample values crate-free pork, whether it came from a region operating under ban or if it came from a farmer who's operating voluntarily without using stalls. 
So there's notable heterogeneity in preferences in terms of what pork product would be purchased, depending on the consumer you're talking about, and in turn that's going to result in divergent economic welfare impacts on these same consumers when we implement a ban. One of the key questions was whether or not a statewide ban can be justified in the presence of a voluntarily disadopting, fully labeled, you know, voluntary labeling free market solution to this situation. And the short answer is no. Uh, only 20% of the public have preferences that are consistent with the need for a ban. And it's that fourth segment I just noted or highlighted throughout this paper is referred to as a ban preferring segment. 80% of the public either is indifferent to having a ban or simply having voluntary disadopting producers or they actually discount pork coming from regions operating in a ban because they put a positive value on that producer autonomy. Another thing we wanted to do was we want to quantify the actual economic welfare impacts on consumers. And as I noted earlier, I'm not going to highlight specific numbers here, but what I want to particularly note out is given the heterogeneous preferences that consumers have, there are quite divergent, very uh, widely spread welfare effects on consumers depending upon what the preference set is. All these numbers on the screen here are negative, and that suggests that there are negative welfare impacts for all consumers when we get through the ban, given that the alternative of voluntary disadoption additional labeling is a real-world option that's available for the industry. What are the implications of this study? Well, first, U.S. consumers are rather heterogeneous in their preferences and basically what they would like the industry to do regarding gestation creates and stall use. Lots of consumers reveal that they're not happy with the practice, However, if you bring to the table the option of voluntary disadoption and the corresponding product labeling as opposed to bans, there's a lot of consumers that support that option. Accordingly, free market alternatives to bans on production practices might be optimal. Those shouldn't be lost in ongoing discussions on this issue. Thirdly, the close voting on ballot initiatives, in particular implications of the banned preferring segment we're talking about today, disproportionately showing up to vote on ballots could be huge. Uh, if you'll note, about 20% of our sample had preferences that support a ban, but by definition, the majority of those that showed up to vote in different states that had ballot initiatives supported a ban. So there's a disconnect there. The extent to which one segment shows up to vote more than the public um, cares about the issue as related to their exercise decision of the meat counter needs to be noted in future economic welfare analyses, and the pork industry obviously is going to struggle with this going forward. More generally, the livestock industry needs to assess that issue on all animal well-being and welfare issues that are being discussed. And finally, what implications does this have for the pork industry? Well, this in itself doesn't say the industry needs to voluntarily disadopt the practice. However, it does suggest that as the industry considers that option, it may relieve some of the pressure that it faces in state-by-state -state bans. In particular, a certain part of the public appears to not like the use of gestation creeks and stalls, but they could be appeased by voluntary disadoption of the practice and a labeling scheme that conveys that information. Ultimately, there needs to be additional work to figure out if that is the best option for the pork industry, but this needs to be considered as one potential way to um, proactively respond to these pressures. Thank you for your time.